Welcome to another episode of Conversations. Today we have Lisa Skinner. Welcome, Lisa, and thank you so much for coming on the show. Hi, Dawn. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate you inviting me onto your wonderful show. Yes, I'm super excited about this. So um, Lisa is an author and a behavioral specialist, and her expertise is in Alzheimer's disease and related dementia, which is a great topic. I, I really want to delve into this because I think that there are a lot of myths about it that I would like to bust and I want you to bust them. Um, but before we get into all that, tell me what got you on this path of wanting to learn about Alzheimer's and dementia. Well, it wasn't something that I thought about growing up. Like when I grow up, I want to be a... <laughs> an expert on dementia, but I'll tell you where it started was like 50 years ago when my grandmother started showing signs of something. We didn't know what it was. And I went to visit her one day and she started telling me, I was like 16. She started telling me about these birds that were living in her mattress and they would come out at night and peck her face. Oh, and yeah, she uh, had hundreds of rats running all over her house that were invading her mm. and then proceeded to tell me about these men these people she called them the, those people uh who were breaking in and stealing her jewelry and she was absolutely convinced they were going to ultimately harm her mm. and i'm there listening to these stories thinking this has got to be the most preposterous, far-fetched thing I have ever heard. And I didn't know my grandmother to ever make anything up. She was a really conservative, straight-laced woman. Right. So I went home and I said, what's wrong with grandma? She's telling me all these weird, bizarre stories. And my mom says, oh, grandma has been diagnosed with senile dementia. That's what they called it back then. Okay. But she didn't say word to me. And I said, Mom, why didn't you tell us? And she says, you, we don't talk about that, which was very typical. And since my grandmother, I've had seven more family members come down with one of the over 200 brain diseases that cause dementia. Uh, five of those were blood relatives. Three were in-laws. So when I was finally went to college, I took a course in, I was always really interested in psychology and I took a course in human behavior. And after that, I knew that's what I wanted to do. So um, I kind of stumbled into the elder care industry um, by answering an ad for a, a community counselor at uh, assisted living and memory care. And that's kind of what got me going on um, my 30 year career as a specialist, helping other families um, go through the heartbreaking and, um, you know, the daunting challenges that, that accompany these diseases. Yeah, gosh. The first myth that I want you to bust, because that it kind of comes right up to that, is is it this are Alzheimer's and dementia the same thing? They are not. So okay. Alzheimer's is one of these two hundred plus diseases, brain diseases that cause dementia. Dementia is not an illness, and a lot of people think it's either um, that they're the same thing dementia and Alzheimer's, or they think they're completely two separate diseases. So let's start with what it is and what it isn't. Yeah. This is one of the common myths out there. So when we use the term dementia, we're really referring, and it's used as an umbrella statement, a blanket term that really refers to the symptoms that follow these diseases. And we kind of have a saying in my world that 
if you've known one person with Alzheimer's disease, you've only known one person with Alzheimer's disease. And that's true of all these other brain diseases like Parkinson's and Huntington's disease and Lewy body dementia and frontotemporal dementia. Everybody experiences it a little bit differently. And the symptoms overlap with one another. So all these symptoms are put into this bucket that we call dementia. Okay. So um, it's very similar. This is just to kind of help people wrap their heads around this concept. When we have the flu, we experience symptoms and everybody kind of experiences different symptoms. Some people get a fever. Some people get the body aches and the chills. Some people get, get an upper respiratory infection. I mean, we all experience the flu differently, Mm -hmm. but the way that we know that we have something like the flu or a cold is based on the symptoms that we're experiencing. And we go to our doctor and we say, okay, well, I have this symptom and this symptom and this symptom. So when we're talking about the symptoms, relate that to the term dementia. Dementia refers to symptoms. Okay. There is another, yeah, there's an underlying cause that are, that, um, that are creating these symptoms and that's the disease, whether it's Alzheimer's or one of the other ones that I mentioned. And that is the difference. So dementia really is referring to symptomology, not, it's not a separate disease. Okay. And that's so good to know because I have never known the difference and I didn't know if there were levels of Alzheimer's or levels of dementia, you know, um, similar to say autism. I like, I didn't know. Right. Right. And so I wasn't sure how that all worked. So people progress um, just to clarify, Alzheimer's disease is degenerative and progressive. There's no known cure. We don't even really know for sure what causes it. And people progress through um, several different stages. And there are two models of stages. One is a seven-step stage and one's a three-step stage. I like to use the three-step stage, which is mild, moderate, and severe. Okay. Um but everybody progresses through the stages differently and shows different symptoms as they progress through the stages. And again, there's overlap between the different brain diseases that cause, but the long and the short is, um, it is progressive and people will progress through the, um, the different stages till it is final. It's a terminal illness that you cannot recover from yet. Okay. And I know you told me at the beginning that you had five family members besides your grandma that had, um, what you don't say contracted. What do you say? They developed, they developed. Yeah, I, I use the term developed. Okay. So does that mean it's hereditary? It absolutely is hereditary, but that doesn't mean that it tends to run in families and there is a genetic component to Alzheimer's disease, uh, which is a gene that is passed down to uh, children by their parents. It's called the APOE4 gene. And uh, if you do inherit the APOE4 gene. You can inherit one from your mother. You can also inherit one from your father. So it's possible that you could carry two. So if you have one of these APOE4 genes versus two, which means you got it from both parents, it's going to increase your risk of developing Alzheimer's disease, but it certainly doesn't mean that for sure you're going to get it or you're going to develop it. It just increases your risk. Okay. So because they don't know 
how to cure it. Are there things that people can do to prevent the it from taking over? There are. Okay. And so I don't know how in depth you want me to go on that topic because um, kind of the, the short version is there are many, many, many risk factors that we know of that contribute to a person's risk level of developing Alzheimer's disease. You've got risk factors that we call uh, non-modifiable. In other words, you can't change those risk factors if you have them. You're stuck with them. Okay. Then there's risk factors that we call modifiable because we can treat those risk factors and negate it from increasing your risk of developing. So basically what I'm saying is the more of these risk factors that apply to any one individual, the higher their risk will be of developing Alzheimer's disease later in life, starting at age 65. So let me, the, the short list is the ones that are non-modifiable. The number one non-modifiable risk factor is a person's age. And we can't change that. Right. We, we are the age we are. <laughs> so that's not, well, that's why we call it non-modifiable. And again, um, starting at around the age 65 um, is when Alzheimer's disease, the traditional um, form of Alzheimer's disease starts to show up. And then every five years that you age beyond the age of 65, your risk increases substantially. So 65 is when it starts to show up at 70, your chances are, are higher 75 by the time any of us are 85 years old, one in three of us will have Alzheimer's disease. If we keep trending the way we're trending today, Gosh, the, the number of people, it is very scary. The number of people who are projected to develop Alzheimer's disease worldwide based on the um, Alzheimer's Association and the World Health Organization are expected to, to almost triple by the year 2050. And that's only 21 years away. Is that because so we're living longer? Um, be, well, part of the, yes. And there's a lot more um, correlations that the studies are showing um, that do increase our risk, like diet and lifestyle choices. And there's a whole list of them. So a um, couple other non-modifiable are gender. Women are known, and we're not sure what the reason is, are known to um, develop Alzheimer's disease more than men. And one of the um, hypotheses is because women outlive men. Okay. And it's a, it's a disease that shows up later in life. So if we're outliving men, then that stands to reason. Right, that, right. Yeah. And then um, our, our ethnicity plays a huge role in our um, risk factor. So um, African-Americans are at higher risk. Latinos are at higher risk. Pacific Islanders are at higher risk than uh, the Caucasian counterparts, and we can't do anything about that. Right. Yeah. And then genetics is the other non-modifiable risk factor. And again, if you carry the gene, one or two of them, um, it still doesn't mean that you're definitely going to get it. You're just at a higher risk. Then we have the whole list of modifiable, and I won't go deep into that. Yeah. But the number one modifiable risk factor for developing Alzheimer's disease is cardiovascular disease and um, diabetes, but they can be treated. Right. So that's why we call it modifiable because if you're being treated for any cardiovascular condition, or if you're treated for diabetes or any of these other known risk factors, then that will kind of negate that from being a higher risk factor and kind of adding it um, 
into your bucket of risk factors because once again the more that apply to any individual the higher their risk becomes of developing it does it mean they definitely will if every single thing applied to them no but it's going to increase their chances of developing it so and there are things that we can do besides treating medical conditions that have a correlation to the risk of developing Alzheimer's and that's healthy lifestyle choices. Exercise is a big one and it doesn't have to be no pain, no gain kind of exercise. Walking mm -hmm. has been, um, has been shown to really help, um, lower that risk factor and eating, um, you know, complex carbohydrates and leafy green vegetables as opposed to ultra processed foods and simple carbohydrates. These are all studies that have shown direct correlations to those risk factors. Yeah, it's interesting when you said the number one was cardiovascular and then diet, or I'm sorry, diabetes. And so then I'm sitting here thinking sugar and inactivity. I mean, that's basically what it comes to mind when you say those two things, cardiovascular yeah. equals yeah. exercise and diabetes equals sugar. So if people eliminate most of their sugar from their diet and get up and move around, then they would limit, take down some of the odds. Is that right? They would. If you're, you're spot on with your analysis there, you're a hundred percent right. And it stands to reason it makes sense. And our, we know our brains do not like sugar. They really don't, it really does not like sugar. And one of the reasons why we see a higher risk is because we know sugar and some of these other foods. I think there's really something to be said about you are what you eat yeah. because of the foods that they've shown, the ultra processed foods, the processed foods, the simple carbohydrates, which are your white things like your white bread, your white flour, your sugary things. Um, they, they create inflammation and that inflammation goes to our brains. And this is one of the theories of why these um, have shown correlation to um, increasing a person's risk because we're putting things into our body that creates inflammation. And there's been a direct um connection between inflammation in your body and your brain to developing these brain diseases. Right. Is there, are there supplements out there now? I mean, okay. If your diet is garbage, obviously supplements are not going to help, but are there supplements out there that do help for brain health that could actually maybe alter your odds? Well, that remains to be seen there's nothing approved by the fda right um there are speculations and and theories that certain supplements can help like fish oils and things like that but to my knowledge and i do a lot of research on this stuff i i spend a lot of time keeping up on the latest information yeah. so i can keep my clients and my followers informed as best I can. There's nothing that's been proven that does what the claims are out there. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So yeah. It, it's, um, it's, I would say that because the FDA does not get involved in um, testing and studying and those type trials and all those things that they do on um, prescribed medications right. or supplements that it's really just um, I would say speculation yeah. I mean people swear by some of these things but there's there's really no proof to date right so I take supplements to reduce inflammation because I believe wholeheartedly in the theory that inflammation can increase a person's risk for um, developing these brain diseases. So that's my personal choice. Yeah, no, that it makes, makes sense, sense though. To me. Yeah, it totally makes sense to me that inflammation would not be a good thing. So I, I take supplements for that. But I mean, I'm not like 
popping vitamins and things like that, right and left, because I just, I don't know. Nobody right. knows. Right. What, what are supplements that help with inflammation? Like what's an example? Oh, fish oil. Okay. Um, krill oil, those type of things. Okay. Um, so people get, a, they get scared if they, as they get older or and maybe not even getting older, maybe just all of a sudden things aren't just coming to them. Their memory is just not as sharp as they want it to be, or they feel like they're starting to lose it. The fear sets in, you know, like, Oh Absolutely. my God, am I going to, so what is it? Is it a memory thing? Does it have anything to do with memory? Is that a I symptom? Have so many people come to me when they find out what I do and kind of under their breath say, Sometimes I can't remember where I put my keys or, you know, yes. some of the normal aging forgetfulness issues that we all start to have after what, about the age of 40. Yeah. And or sooner. Or sooner. And they're really, really scared that they're developing Alzheimer's disease. And I think that um, people are deathly afraid of getting it, of developing mm -hmm. it, which I don't blame them. I mean, I've spent 30 years around, well, 50 years, if you want to include my grandmother, around people with cognitive loss. And um, we, you know, it seems like everybody out there has an Alzheimer's story. One thing I want to add before I forget, Alzheimer's, the traditional form of it is known as an older person's illness. But, and I don't know the reason, more and more younger people are developing what's called early onset Alzheimer's which shows up before the age of 65. And it's becoming more common where before it was actually considered the rare form. But I'd say in the last 10 years, we've seen an uptick in the number of younger people developing early onset Alzheimer's. So that's a little intimidating and scary. It is. Uh, it really is. It could be attributed to environmental factors and the diet and lifestyle issues that we just discussed. So I just kind of want to say strongly and emphasize this. It's not too, it's never too soon to start really taking it seriously, what you put in your bodies. Mm -hmm. And getting proper exercise, regular exercise, because if what you do today can make a difference to developing Alzheimer's in 20 years or 30 years, I think it's really worth making those lifestyle choices and changes to not develop these brain diseases. Um, but to answer your question, so there are different stages of memory deficit. So there's the normal aging, which really happens to most of us. I can tell you <laughs> I'm experiencing it. Um, you know, names, I'm just not as sharp with names as I used to be. And I'll walk into my kitchen and have to stop and go, now, what did I come in here for? Am I worried that that's the start of dementia? No. Um, then there's the next deficit that's called mild cognitive impairment and that is a more severe um deficit than just normal memory loss due to aging it's more noticeable and it's a little bit um you you notice more cognitive issues now some people who develop mild cognitive impairment it will progress into Alzheimer's disease and dementia, but not for everybody. It can just stay in mild cognitive impairment. And the difference is, is if it's Alzheimer's or another brain disease causing the um, cognitive loss, then it will turn into dementia. If it's just a more noticeable um, situation of the normal aging process but you just have it a little bit more severely than like me who forgets names and things like that mm -hmm. uh, 
then it'll just stay as mild cognitive impairment because it's not actually being caused by a brain disease. Then you have full-blown dementia, which is the progressive degenerative, and that is caused by one of these many brain diseases that we know exist out there that cause the um, cognitive decline um, as you progress through the you know mild, moderate, and severe stage of dementia. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. I could get on a soapbox, but I am not a professional. I just feel like ever since way long ago and they started messing with our food, <laughs> something happened, messing with the animals, messing with the way that, um, you know, pesticides and all that stuff. Like they've come up with so many Netflix documentaries and everything about how our food has been altered so much. Um, starting with the whole canning process during, you know, the industrial revolution, all that stuff. It's like, ever since they started messing with our food, it seems like the more and more you hear about all of these terrible. I could not agree with you more. And I didn't mention this because I, I mentioned that I've had eight family members, five of those mm -hmm. were blood relatives, but I also had a dog who developed dementia. And when my dog started showing signs of dementia that I recognized in humans from working mm -hmm. with so many decades, I'm thinking to myself, am I just reading into thinking this dog might have dementia? I didn't even know dogs got dementia. So I took him to the vet and sure enough, the dog did, I mean, the, the vet did some tests and he said, Lisa, you're right. You're not reading into anything. This dog has dementia. Yeah. They call it cognitive impairment. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is to piggyback on what you just said. Statistically, and I found this out going through it with my dog, 50% of dogs nowadays, starting about the age 11, 12, 13, are developing canine cognitive impairment, aka doggy dementia. It's got to be the food processing. I mean, why all of a sudden are half dogs who live beyond the age of, you know, 13-ish, 14-ish, yep, yep. 50%. That's yeah. Crazy. Yeah. My dog had, my dog had ah. dementia. She, she was on Prozac just to keep her calm because of her, she didn't even recognize me at the end yeah. and, and that she was my little buddy. And that I was know. part of the, my reasoning for putting her down, which was one of the most traumatic days of my life. But yeah, it's sad. It's well, sad. my little dog started showing the symptoms. He was a cockapoo. Yeah. And I noticed it when he turned about 15, but he lived till he was 18 and a half. Mm. And there was nothing wrong with him health wise. He was perfectly healthy. He just didn't know what planet he lived on. And I knew how to care for him because of my years of experience working with humans. But it was it was sad to see yeah. him go through that. And I'm sure it was sad for you to see yeah. your dog go through that, too. Right. Well, because at first it was kind of. I shouldn't even say this, but it was kind of funny because I was like, my dog's on Prozac. What the heck? But <laughs> but then it was like, I could see it in her eyes. You know, I could yeah. see that she, she just didn't know who I was anymore. And it was very hard. It was, I couldn't imagine on the level of it being a parent or a grandparent, because when it was just my dog, it was very traumatic. But anyway, um, so I, I had done a podcast episode, geez, probably like almost two years ago and talking with, um, a doctor about brain health. And it's so funny how people are so hyper-focused on their faces and <laughs> Botox and all this. And it's like, you want to have your wits about you, even if you have a nice body. But um, so all of these, all of these um, apps and how your phone does everything, your computer does everything. It does spell check. It remembers your phone numbers. Like there's so many things now that are taking over where you do not have to use your brain and remember things anymore. It's kind of scary. Like, I don't know anybody's number that's in my family, except for my mom, because she just has her landline. And that has been the same since I was little, but we're not forced to remember and recall all that information anymore. And studies have shown a correlation between that and 
more and more people developing brain, these brain diseases because we're not exercising our brains like we should be, you know, we're well, maybe watching too much TV, we're letting um, technology do our thinking for us. Like you said, maybe, maybe part of the problem is the, um, you know, having the phones up to our heads all the time. There's been a lot of, of um, information about how harmful that is to us. So as, as our world has been changing so dramatically in the last 20, 30, 40 years, you know, maybe there is a connection between the number of people developing Alzheimer's disease and some of these things that we've talked about. I mean, that makes sense to me too. Right. And it was interesting to me what you said earlier about how um, every every person experiences the disease differently. So there's mm -hmm. not straight across the board, whatever, because I do know someone that has Parkinson's and I did not realize all of the different things. It's not just the shakes. There's so many other things that come into play for Parkinson's. So what else besides memory would people experience if they have Alzheimer's? That's a great question. And the reason why it's such a great question, because you, you said you wanted to bust a few myths, and that is one of the myths that's been circulating around forever, that people um, associate Alzheimer's disease pretty exclusively with memory loss and confusion. And it is so much more complicated than that. People literally lose their ability to reason, to make judgments, to um, control their emotions. Mm -hmm. um, it just goes on and on and on. And this is all part of what we call dementia. Okay. So Alzheimer's can cause it. Parkinson's. Now, I don't know if you're aware of this. This is one thing that's really, really unique about Parkinson's disease. It doesn't always cause dementia. People can have Parkinson's disease and live with it for years and years and years and never have the cognitive decline. Like Michael J. Fox is a perfect example. He's been okay. living with Parkinson's disease for over 30 years. He was diagnosed with it and it was 29 years old and he does not have the dementia. But I have seen over the years, so many people living in memory care who started out with Parkinson's disease and the dementia developed uh, years later and they have, you know, all the same symptoms as people who or not all of them, but similar symptoms as people who are living with Alzheimer's disease and Lewy body disease and vascular. So um, there's a lot of overlapping, but not everybody who gets Parkinson's gets the dementia and um there's some theories as to why some do and why some don't but we probably don't have time to go into that <laughs> this is very well you were telling topic <laughs> <laughs> well that leads me to I, I did not realize but you told me before we hit record that you have your own podcast so uh, that's phenomenal because for people that love this information that you've given so far and want more of it. So how often do you put out an episode and what, tell me the name of it and what you cover all of it. Okay. So I am, my podcast is on 39 platforms. They're all the popular ones and it's called the truth lies and Alzheimer's show. Um, and sometimes I have guests, sometimes I just do them solo um, and I talk about a different aspect of living with Alzheimer's disease and these other brain diseases every week. And I do a lot of research. So I keep everybody as informed on all the, you know, latest and updated information that I can find and just really um, provide tips and insights into how caregivers and family members can provide um, a higher quality life for people living with this disease because I honestly believe 
wholeheartedly because I've seen the magic happen that it doesn't necessarily, uh, an Alzheimer's diagnosis does not necessarily mean it's the end of your life. I have seen so many people live fulfilling, memorable, purposeful lives for decades with this disease, but it takes very specialized skills from the part of caregivers to know how to provide that for people. It's called a person-centered approach to care, and that's what I practice and have practiced for 30 years. Um, so yeah, it's called The Truth, Lies, and Alzheimer's Show. Lisa Skinner is me, and I'm the host. And it's on all of the, it's not on YouTube, but it's on all of the other platforms, 39 platforms. That's a lot of platforms. And then you also have a book. I have several books. Do you? Um, okay. I, yeah. So my first book was called, um, um, Not All Who Wander Need Be Lost. And it was a two times a bestseller and award-winning book. It won the um, Living Now Award, which in 2016, it won the Bronze Award for being one of the most inspirational books oh, written in that year. Um, That's awesome. And then I, I updated that book and it's the same title as my podcast, The Truth Lies truth lies in Alzheimer's it's secret faces because this disease has a lot of secret faces that people aren't even aware of um, like all of these other cognitive um, problems that people develop with dementia so um, yeah so that book the newest book the newest edition is called truth lies and Alzheimer's, it's secret faces. And then I also have a really, really comprehensive training program available. Um, you could go to my website, uh, www.mindingdementia.com if you're interested. It's literally, I just, it took me two years to write it and it just came out. It's literally 30 years of professional experience and you know, personal experience with all my family members, all wrapped into a very comprehensive foundational understanding of Alzheimer's disease that will help people have a clearer understanding of, of what um, happens to people who live with the disease. And I think it really starts there. Um, because it is such a complicated disease. Gosh, it really is. And you explained it all so wonderfully. I learned a ton and I would love it if you would come back again another time and we can, um, if people send me questions that they might have, because I, or, you know, just uh, go listen to her podcast, go look, read her books. I mean, I just think it's so important to get this information out there because until people do straighten out their diets and their exercise and really take this serious, it's going to be here. It's not going anywhere. Well, I would um, be honored to come back on your show. I would love it if you would like to be a guest on my show. We could pick up where we left off today and continue this conversation because truly, Dawn, there is so much to talk about. Right. And knowledge is power. You can't you can't debate that knowledge is power. And I believe that the more you understand about these brain diseases that cause dementia, it's going to give family members and caregivers superpowers to, you know, to, to survive this and right. survive it in a positive way, yeah, not in a negative way, because we look at these diseases as doom and gloom, and it really doesn't have to be like that. I think it's just scary. I think that's what it is. It's just scary not knowing what's going to happen to your yourself. <laughs> it's like, am it's I good? do I have scary. a target on my back? You know, is this exactly. going to happen? Yeah, yeah, it's scary. So, thank you so much for taking the time, especially being under the weather. I really appreciate you being here today, and um, I will definitely be in touch. Oh, good. I look forward to uh, having another conversation about this with you at some point. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. Okay. Thank you so much, Lisa. And we'll talk soon. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Uh -huh, bye. Bye.